my name is Pilar Garcia Fernandez Sesma. I'm an animator and illustrator working out of New York City. Hi, I am Esther. I am also an animator, illustrator. I kind of work in commercials, but I kind of just draw. I watched your film in passing and it was actually really interesting because I was wondering like what, you know, when they paired us up and stuff, like what kinds of things Same. we have in common and like, I actually was surprised like how much we had in common with the films, even though they're like completely different in some ways. It was interesting because we were both sort of approaching like culture and memory in, in a way, but like not necessarily directly because you were working with like snippets of your parents, what your parents told you about their childhood um, and sort of piecing it together into like yeah. a fictionalized story based on that. And then I was sort of taking like pieces of my own memory of like going to Spain and like experiences that I've like part of it, like real like memories of mine and then like fictionalized storytelling, but like also yeah. indirectly. And I think it's, it's interesting how like, especially people who either like families immigrated to other countries or have like different experiences growing up in different places, how we like use that for storytelling or in, in a way to connect to our own cultures because we feel yeah. like a little bit removed from them. Yeah, 100%. But, how do you find your own experiences in Spain like take, like translate into the film? Yeah, a lot of a lot of what my my own memories were were just like you know stuff like catching insects and like being outside. A lot of like the environment itself, like obviously like none of the specific story elements were like things that actually happened to me. But some of the things that like the main character, the girl, does like are very visceral to me. Like being in sunflower fields and like catching crawfish at the river. And and I guess for context, like my film is about uh, for people who haven't seen it, it's about like domestic violence and like a home in, in like a magical realism kind of settings based on like the perspective of like a young kid. And I I do think it's it's interesting you also have like an insect in your I know. in your film as well. <laughs> <laughs> and it's also kind of like the perspective of the children and like how big and like loud everything is. But I, I was wondering if like what the meaning of like the little insect that they're following around is. It's kind of exactly kind of how you said it, where you remember catching insects as a kid. My dad told me about when he was a kid, he would catch dragonflies and tie them to a piece of string and fly them around like a pet. And so it was really weird because when I was a kid, I would also, my dad taught me how to catch dragonflies. And it was just this thing where you just catch bugs as a kid. And so I was like, I'm definitely putting it in. It's just very, I guess, human. And it's very interesting because I saw it in your film. I was like, oh. I, that's me. Yeah, it's kind of wild how, cause I, I kind of approached it the same way, like when I was making the film, I think, I didn't consciously like put insect motifs in necessarily to convey like a sense of like escaping or freedom or like, I don't know, childlike wonder or something. But a lot of people and, and myself, when I would like watch the film back, like I got a lot of that from it, but really it was just like based on childhood experiences. But it's really interesting how both of our films sort of give the sense of like the insect being trapped or wanting to like be free yeah. and like the sense of children wanting to do things but being restricted or constricted in some way. I liked how like the sound always happens outside of like off screen in your film, which is kind of like with that restrictive thing, like you never see what's what's happening. You always hear it before you see it. Oh, that's, but... that's really interesting. I don't think I've had someone like directly specify that sort of thing before about my film or yeah. like take that away from it really i feel like everything happens off screen like the dad's the sound is always happening outside and then you turn and you're not even looking at them you're looking at them through the door and you just hear them fighting and i was like oh that's really clever or like when she's running off and then the the like the trap gets like caught on the dad you hear that off screen first before you even see it. You just see a shadow. And so I was just like, I really like that you don't, you're not just watching the dad get trapped. It just feels very, you're like also a step removed from it. You're watching, you're watching almost the secondary action. Like of, you know, like when, when like a bride walks down the aisle, sometimes you just don't watch the bride and you watch the groom's reaction instead. It's kind of like that where you're just like, you're watching the kid's reaction to everything or you're just or you're kind of taking from the kids point of view instead of watching a fight which i really enjoyed yeah i mean i i guess like kind of 
was trying to focus on on just like the girl's perspective so i think part of it was like well it, it was unintentional in the sense that i wasn't doing that on on purpose like really <laughs> thinking about it but i think like part of it being that the girl's always the main character like you're seeing everything from her perspective and also like just showing enough you know like i feel like sometimes it's really easy with like more violent films to like show a bunch of things and it can be like really traumatic for people and it's not all just about like sort of traumatic experiences as they're happening to you and a lot of it is like what's happening around you like different elements what you're seeing besides that like how you feel so i think i really wanted to focus on like feelings and not necessarily just like oh straightforward like bad things are happening and people are sad because it's a lot more complex than that too with with sort of oh, yeah. difficult topics like that and i, I feel like your film also convey sort of like an interesting mood especially with like what since we've been talking about like off-screen sounds like the sort of constant drone of the plane just being present even though it's only shown in one shot and like how it sort of builds this like strange tension yeah i guess i i sort of tried to do that where i also just tried to take the view of the kids when i've been to hong kong in the past there's just always this drone of sound of like traffic of something but like it's never quiet i remember like the first time i came back to canada and i like i was like lying in bed i was like why is it so quiet like there's ringing in my ears like left over from being in hong kong and being for it being so loud so it's kind of like that where i was just like trying to convey hong kong but also hearing everything constantly happening as like life is life is still happening outside of just the kids lives so you're not just focused on what's inside, but you're always hearing that there's something happening outside. You just don't know, you don't always know what. Yeah, like I, I also really like how you use the the weather is sort of like centering it in reality and like everything else that's happening is sort of this like strange dream, like child mind. <laughs> but you would like in the background, you just like sort of get like grounded by just that whole like weather channel and everything that's happening there in the background. Yeah, yeah that was like a, kind of not a last minute change like add in but I just wanted to show these kids going through Hong Kong typhoons are a huge thing in Hong Kong they just they happen all the time they like go from little typhoons to just like huge typhoons and so like everybody's lives are affected and like revolve around these typhoons happening mine kind of follows the weather but I found yours the lighting quite stayed the same and it was like interesting and I wonder if it was intentional because it made it feel more tense where it's just like there wasn't what do you call that thing where the weather changes with the mood yeah you didn't do that and I thought that was like extra creepy because she's just like running through beautiful sunflower fields or like the same river she was just catching crayfish in for funsies she's like now like running away from and everything's just the same but the mood's just way different I think I was definitely like focused on I, I mean, obviously there is like different weather patterns in, everywhere, but totally. <laughs> a lot of like the sensation you get, or at least from my memory, like going to visit family in Spain, like in the summer. So it's very like hot, very dry, very quiet, but like that like rural quiet where like there's lots of insects that are just like echoing off in the distance really creepily. And then like there's no wind, there's no one around, like especially in like the really rural areas. So like it's very desolate but full so i think i think part of it was that like the sensation of like being isolated but being completely surrounded by things and like animals and life in this very totally. like weird way yeah because i felt it i was like there's nobody else but like these three characters and these two of them are victims basically but like just the deer but the deer can't help you so it's just like <laughs> Yeah, it was quite interesting. You got that across like really well. Were there like artist inspirations or like movies and stuff that you look towards in making the film? Yeah, I think um, I surprisingly like none of my like inspirations for this film are animation. <laughs> I feel like I <laughs> I feel me like, either. No worries. Or at least with with my own style, like I'm I'm sure I have like actual like inspirations, but not anything I was looking at concretely. I think I was just. Um, I've always really loved like especially the two Guillermo del Toro films that are like about the Spanish Civil War. So mm -hmm. he's got a uh, Pan's Labyrinth it. and then The Devil's Backbone. Oh, yeah, yeah I've watched, and I've never watched Devil's Backbone. Okay. That one yeah, that one's underrated. Uh, okay. but it, but it's interesting cuz 
he sort of also, both those films are like a really difficult period of time where a lot of like bad things are happening, but both are from the perspective of children. And like, yeah. there's an element of like fantasy or like magical realism that he uses that's like sort of real and sort of not real. Like you're not sure like how real it is like exactly, but it's sort of like an escapism from the hardness of the situation and also like an, a, a metaphor to what's happening like through fantasy, which I think was like really interesting the way he did it. Cause I know it's hard to make like films about really difficult subjects and make them palatable in yeah. that kind of way where like you don't feel like you're um, just like whitewashing everything and making it too safe, but also not just like doing glorified violence all the time. Um, oh, yeah. And it's like in a very easily digestible package, I guess, in a way. Um, yeah. So I, I think definitely like Guillermo del Toro, like those two films were like inspirations to me for this one. And then I can't really think of anything else concretely. I don't know. I really like Wong Kar Wai's like color work, I guess. <laughs> that yep. too yeah and like the intimacy of like characters i guess i guess that's sort of also an inspiration yeah what about you mine was actually Wan kar wai's <laughs> films i mean he's a hong kong director so i kind of had to look at his stuff in the mood for love and chunking express are like my two favorite movies like of all time but like the way that he just puts characters together well like in chunking express they like they're like two separate lives and I love that. And I, I kind of just wanted to tell a story of like characters that never meet. Like a lot of my neighbors, I'm like, like I've been living beside you for like 20 years and I'm just like, do I, do I actually know you? Like, do I know? And so it's just kind of like that. I'm just like, it's interesting to see two separate lives that just like always cross paths but never meet. And so that was kind of like what I wanted to tell. And like, yeah, like, Man, Wan Kar Wai is a master, but also like the way he does colors, but the way he shows like he, his stuff always somehow happens at nighttime because I guess Hong Kong's nightlife and like it's just beautiful as a city, the lights. So you kind of it's just the place to put it. But I remember when my experience of Hong Kong was really different because I would just wake up really early in the morning and then like go to bed at like right after it like got dark and so I like never really went out at night so I just wanted to tell sort of my version of it I wanted to tell Hong Kong in the day but yeah Wong Kar Wai is probably one of my faves and like I definitely look to to like see how to do and see what I should not do yeah what was the first project that sort of made you fall in love with filmmaking and directing probably this one because like this is probably my like long well it's definitely my longest and definitely like my only film and I'm like hooked. <laughs> so definitely this one. How about That's you? How it goes. I, I actually did a another film at uh, I went to RISD, so they do like your junior Multiple. year, you do two films, one per semester. And then your senior year you do like the long film, which was Theodore. I did that my okay. senior year. So my junior year, one of my two films was a documentary about like uh, an undocumented immigrant. I know like uh, how she like came to the US and like leaving her family behind yeah. and it got into slam dance and I remember going there and I was like well oh no like I guess I'm gonna be an indie filmmaker and make no money because I'm obsessed I know that was like me when I made this film and then I went to like a couple film festivals and I was just made filmmakers and I'm like damn it I'm like damn it I'm hooked I'm like, where's the grants? I gotta start looking. And yeah, then, well, I'm sure, I don't know if Canada has more grants, but the US is scarce. There's some in Canada. I wouldn't say it's abundant, but they're there if you dig hard enough, I think. Yeah. How'd you get into animation? Um, I I feel like a lot of animators say that they started animating really young, but I- I think so too. I, I did not. I was a, big drawing person, like big illustrator, since I was like a baby, like I was drawing forever. I came out of the womb with drawing, I guess. <laughs> but I I went to uh, RISD, right? I was like, oh, I wanna go to uh, an art college. And I guess my mentality with art is just like, oh, I always wanna try something new. And I was like, well, I've been drawing a lot and I feel really confident in like my illustration capacity. And like, I could go into illustration at RISD and like learn more, but I feel pretty strong there and I want to like learn something completely new. And I was yeah. like a big fan of animation. It's like close by 
uh, and I think it's cool. So I was like, yeah, I'll, I'll just like go into filmmaking and stuff. And See? now I'm here. Now I'm an animator. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Oh my goodness. Amazing. Yeah. What about you? Um, kind of same. I also did not start animating. In fact, I don't know, when I was a kid, I was just like, I'm never being an artist when I grow up. I like dabbled in other things. And then, and then my dad was like, you should just draw. It's like what you do. And I was like, oh, oh my goodness. And when an Asian parent says that, that's like insane because no Asian parent says that. <laughs> so I was like, I guess I'm going to art school. And then basically I was also pretty like, my illustration was fine, but I wanted to keep my business options open because if I learn animation, that's just drawing. That's like drawing with movement versus illustration, which is drawing without movement. And I can work on all the other things while I work on animation. And then later when I graduate, I can animate or illustrate. Instead of if I go into illustration, I, I wouldn't know how to animate. And so that's kind of, it was like a, business decision <laughs> on that part and then now I'm an animator yeah it kind of gets sucked in and then you're there forever I, I know like, it's kind of addicting yeah there's definitely some people who are more illustrators and then they take an animation class and they're like I can't do this yeah totally <laughs> I feel totally. like you definitely have to be a masochist like you have to like love to torture yourself by just like drawing the same thing over and over again and Legit. getting like two seconds of work I know and like for me I hate I, I, not hate, I just don't like doing rig things or 3D or puppet things, unless it's stop motion, which is also like, same. Yeah. I guess along the same lines as 2D, but like in work, I specialize in cell, like cell animation. I'm just like, damn, why am I choosing the hardest one to do <laughs> basically? Yeah. I had this really amazing, like these amazing thesis professors, Amy Kravitz and Steve Sabotnik, who are like otherworldly. There's like no way to describe them. They're like, some like ethereal beings of animation that are like okay. ancient and endless and everyone loves them because <laughs> they're great but okay they basically uh i guess an amalgamation of things they've, they've uh taught me is just like amy is very much like a feelings person and steve is like an organization person so amy was very much interested in like figuring out how you want to tell stories like not so much like these are rules and then these are things that you need to learn it's like find out what you want to do and then sort of build a system to make those things based on that rather than the other way around because then you sort of have better momentum which i think is like a really useful sort of tool is like figuring out what kind of storytelling you like to do and they, they used to do this that well they do this project where you they give you 500 pieces of paper and you have to animate them in an hour like just straight ahead right you just have whatever tools and you just animate on 500 pieces of paper and then you shoot it and then she would use that to like see what kind of storytelling you're interested in like there were people who like got very abstract and like were very focused on colors and like other people were like trying to tell stories and things or had characters that were interacting and like some people went through like weird experimental ways where they just like did it on the side and i think it's a really really cool experiment because like everyone has a different technique or tactic and thing that they're doing because you're like constrained to such like little time and like so much paper um, oh that is so interesting yeah so definitely that that was like a great project and then something i learned a lot from steve and myself is like organizing yourself is like so important i honestly don't know how the hell i make films as long as i do but i just kind of i just go for it you know i'm very much like a person who's like pre-production I don't know what that is I'm just gonna do it and I'm gonna go from there like it's very like all at once like sound okay let's just randomly put sounds in here let's animate this uh let's redo a storyboard and, and just kind of roll with it make it organic oh I and <laughs> like sort of organic yeah, just love plan that. ahead plan <laughs> ahead and sort of like make a schedule for yourself so that you don't feel overwhelmed like work a little yeah. bit every day if you can or like chunks of time in the week so that you're not just like how am I ever going to finish this? And then somehow That's, you get there. <laughs> I don't know if I like have good advice from people. I feel like I was mostly just like not listening to people and just like disagreeing with them. So maybe it's like trust your gut, but also your gut's not always right all the time. So listen to people too. <laughs> uh, oh man. I mean, that, that's um, important. Like I definitely feel like with critique, especially as like a student and stuff, like you don't have to take every single crit 
that people yeah. give you because sometimes someone will say I think there's too much red in your film and someone else will be like I don't think there's enough red in your film and you just kind of have to be like well I like the amount that I have I guess I don't yeah <laughs> so like totally. you know take what is useful for you um and like discard the stuff that you don't feel like putting in it because ultimately it's your work exactly totally I agree with that I guess maybe one is rest rest i feel like as especially animators i don't know what what's up with them but they just like just keep going and they just don't rest which was me too and like everybody i knew and so i feel like that might be a good one as a piece of advice is just to like rest yeah i definitely feel like most uh people in animation are like very night people and i like definitely can't relate i was definitely more of a kind of person relate. and you know if like students are watching this like pro tip if I mean, if you can wake up early in the morning, wake up early and go to studio. No one will be there until 4 p.m. It's you have true. the whole studio to yourself. Just work from like morning, you know, on a Saturday, like do 8 a.m. to like five or six. And then you can just go home. Everyone else like comes in and they're like animating at two in the morning. Like I, it just seems so stressful to me. I'm like, you know what? I'm going to go in the morning. No one's there. Take yeah. a walk, then go home for dinner. And you just like you just rest in your room. Yeah. Yeah, but I would say just rest and sleep, get eight hours. I think that's important. But yeah, for sure. It definitely kept yeah. me going. <laughs> yeah, same. It was great talking to you. I think yeah. this was like a really interesting conversation. I agree. <laughs>